from partial differential equations to algebra. And I mostly refer to Lie algebra, where Lie is a person. So one physics question here is how could Wolfgang Pauli solve the hydrogen atom, compute the spectrum, without the Schrodinger partial differential equation? He did this in 1926. I don't mean this is a history question. The history is interesting. I also don't really mean a geometric answer that's given this nice blog entry because it's in four dimensions. What I do mean here is can you replace some aspects of PDE calculations by algebra? So I won't do exactly what Pauli did, but something a little bit more modern, although mathematicians might still call this very old. So I'm using the Schrodinger PDE as an example, but the general ideas will be relevant to many different partial differential equations. So in this one, many of the complications are in the Laplacian. The Laplace operator, nabla squared, acting on a function of the angles on the sphere, looks like this. So I'm going to assume that you've heard of spherical harmonics, YLM. They are eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator at fixed radius, for example, 1. Throughout this video, we'll give sample code for certain calculations that make it more efficient. Here I'm going to give in Mathematica, but it's not important. You can use whatever you want. I just want to be concrete. I put a Mathematica notebook, also in PDF, on my webpage with a link from this video. So in this function y, there are some conditions on L and M that I call LM condition. And that's convenient when you want to simplify expressions to tell Mathematica that you're going to use this condition. Because we're solving PDEs, we want to see what happens to this eigenfunction if I just act on it with a single derivative. Let's first take the angle of phi. So I can define an operator, which is essentially a derivative with respect to phi, but I'm throwing in a minus i and h bar. Then I get the eigenvalue h bar m. So for what I do later, the h bar and the i are less important, and the important thing here is that we're doing a derivative and we're getting a eigenvalue back. But Mathematica here, with a simplification, re-expresses the derivative as a linear combination of ylm and ylm plus one. But it's still not a single term, so we can look for a linear combination of these two derivatives, possibly with a cotangent in between them and some overall factor like this, to see if we can just get a single y l m plus 1. So I'm going to act with this combination, which I call l plus, and you can work this out from the expression on the previous page. This is in fact equal to just the y l m plus 1 with a factor in front. So this is like a step up ladder operator. If you're familiar with creation and annihilation operators in quantum mechanics, this is not the same as the basic ones, but it's the same spirit. Let me for later reference call this whole expression h bar times l plus of m. Note that the spherical harmonic is not an eigenfunction of l plus, because m changed, it became m plus 1. But at least it's still a spherical harmonic. So we can use this for computations if we can also find a step down operator. And it's this, I get a different factor in front here. The differ by m goes to minus m, but I'm going to call this one l minus. So notice here we went down in m. But since we have a step up and a step down, we can form down up or up down. And y is going to be an eigenfunction of l plus l minus or l minus l plus. And if we subtract them, we can hope to get something interesting. So I'm using condensed notation here. Imagine acting on y, getting this eigenvalue, and then just removing the y everywhere here. So if you just algebraically compute this combination from these two, I claim you get 2 h bar squared m, which is very nice and simple. So I strongly recommend doing this algebra if you haven't. And since h bar m was the eigenvalue under Lz, we can in fact write this non-trivial result like this. So again, this means acting on the spherical harmonic. So this type of commutator relationship will occupy us for the rest of the video. But let me just put it to the side for now and explicitly introduce the angular momentum. So far, I just talked about some derivative operator. Let's look concretely at the angular momentum acting on some function f. So L is r cross p, and in quantum mechanics, p is realized like this as a gradient. So this now acts on some function f. In Mathematica, you would define this operator acting on the function f with an underscore to show that it's just a dummy that occurs over here. So you take the gradient, you take the cross, and you multiply by this factor. Now define an arbitrary function of x, y, and z and act on it with L. Then you get this, as you can verify if you know how to take the cross product. Now that we have this, we can compute the commutator. So if we define the commutator of two differential operators like this, then I get these commutators. Since I already knew what they're going to be, I can just check that they are true. But if you try this yourself in your favorite symbolic manipulation system, you see that it's non-trivial that the second derivatives that occur in the commutator cancel on the left, so that you just have a single derivative operator on the right. This is usually called by physicist SO3 algebra. The later I will point out that if you Google that, you might get a slightly different version, but this is essentially the SO3 algebra. 
Algebras of this type, Lie algebras, are denoted by fraktur typeface, which I myself learned from writing this word, which also has a metal umlaut. So these are two first order differential operators you can form from the Cartesian LX and LY. There are these Cartesian components, and this satisfies a slightly different algebra. So we can compute it, just put it into Mathematica, compute the commutators, and we see that, for example, L plus L minus is 2H bar LZ. And we've got two more commutators. So this is a different algebra called SL2R. If you just look at it, it's not the same structure as SO3. We got to the second one by some transformation, but they're not the same as algebras. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. Let me first write it nicer. So the first commutators are right like this, and the second set of commutators are right like this. Now, usually angular momentum, R cross P, has to do with the rotations. And in fact, these operators generate rotations in a sense I will return to in a second, whereas this setup can be more convenient for organizing and generalizing in mathematics. So mathematicians tend to talk about this type of algebra, even though from physics point of view, we usually start out as I do here, trying to understand SO3. One way to see that they're not the same is that this one is actually equivalent to or isomorphic to SO2,1. So I get back to that at the end of the video. But again, it's not the same as this. So what does it mean the angular momentum generates rotations? What it means is that if you write a rotation matrix, which I do in a second, to first order in angles, rotations commute, but to second order and higher, they don't. And we can phrase this as there's a non-zero commutator among rotation matrices. So you define unit vectors in the x and z directions. Y is also important in the long term, but here I'm just going to do x and z. So these two rotation matrices, x and z, are given as the following. So the first one is rotation around the x-axis, and the second is rotation around the z-axis. You see that this is nothing on z. Now compute the series expansion of the commutator of rz and rx. You see that to first order, it's zero. You can check it's also true for the other combinations of x and y and z. But you see that to second order, you have a term up here and down here. So there's some matrix that this can be expressed in. There's an entry up here and down here that represents some of the first deviation from commutation. And this commutator zx has something to do with ly as it turns out. But let's first just try to compute lz from the first derivative of the rotation matrix at angle zero. If you just do this computation using this rz matrix, you get this. So in the basic sense of general rotations, this matrix can be said to generate rotations. What I mean by that? Take the matrix exponential of the angle theta that you want to rotate through around the z-axis and this LZM, which is this matrix. Notice this is not the same as the usual exponential. You get something else if you try to do that. This is the matrix exponential, defined as the series expansion of a matrix using matrix multiplication. The SO3 algebra, written with this funny typeface fracture, exponentiates to the group element of special orthogonal group uh, rotation matrices. Now, I haven't at all shown that you can get all elements like this, but at least you got the rotation matrix around Z. Then the three matrices you get this way from the rotation matrices satisfy this algebra, which is even a little simpler than the one we had before. And the relationship is that in quantum mechanics, we usually want Hermitian operators. This is not Hermitian because it's anti-symmetric. If you transpose it, you get minus itself. But if you put an I and you take Hermitian transpose, then you get back the same thing. So L is Hermitian, LM is real and anti-symmetric. So the underlying real algebra is this. So in quantum physics, we then have to have an I up here in H bar to be able to relate these two things. But this is just a definition of how you form a group element. With this relation, we could see call it a real algebra. It's not so useful to think that it becomes sort of a complex algebra. That'd be a very cheap use of complex numbers. The safest to think, especially when talking to people not thinking about quantum physics, that this is the basic algebra and the other one we get by this small change of notation. So these commutators are sufficient to write a group element up to whatever order you want. It is not in general sufficient to get the exact group element because there can be things that are not captured by series expansion. And this you can see in this book, for example, in chapter 8. These algebras, I haven't defined most of this yet, but take SO3. It's related to another algebra in a direct way, but the corresponding groups are not the same. You can miss large transformations like flipping all the axes or flipping time. So the problem here is you can't get to minus a matrix by just adding more and more terms in the exponential of the matrix. If you're interested, we'll come back to this in another video. But for now, I just want to warn you, the generators only capture the local structure of the symmetry, not necessarily the global structure. So back to the physics question, how did Pauli do this? Well, just like Rutherford before him, he used input from astrophysics. In astrophysics, as discussed in Goldstein's book, for example, had been known for a long time. So for example, to Laplace, Runge, and Lenz, but to people before them too, that if you make this combination, of quantities in the Kepler problem of, for example, a planet going around the sun, then this is conserved. So for each point in this orbit, you can form P cross L. You see the blue vector is not the same all the time. The green vector formed from a unit vector is not the same all the time. 
But if the force is exactly inverse square, then the combination A is in fact conserved. The red vector is the same all the time, same direction and same magnitude. Also A always points in this plane. L does not, but A does. So this was classical physics. If you want to know more, read Goldstein, look at this Wikipedia page. There are also many videos about this in classical physics. In the hydrogen atom, we may have to include a ordering term, it's called. Explain to yourself why it's called ordering term. You can determine this constant c in front of this ordering term so that this vector is conserved, where m is the quantum analogy of the a vector. So this as a differential operator acting on some wave function gets a little bit complicated. So again, it's good to use computer systems. So p is defined as minus ih bar of the gradient of f. p squared you form like this. And the Hamiltonian is then defined as p squared over 2m plus the electric potential energy, which is negative. I form p cross x by defining it by hand. I can do it fancier, but when you're first trying it, it's good to be a little bit explicit. And then we form this vector here, just typing this in like that, acting on, again, function f, which will eventually be a wave function. And having implemented m as an operator on functions, we can easily check that m dot l is in fact zero. It's good to inspect these expressions explicitly. This just captures what we saw before. The LRL vector is always in the plane. So let's take that as a fact now. And let's repeat. We have this SO3 algebra. This is just one of the three commutators. Now with this new conserved quantity, we can start considering mixed commutators. So this is not as nice because it mixes them. And this one is even less nice. It's kind of mixed, but you get a Hamiltonian in there. So you can get rid of the Hamiltonian if you decide to only work with eigenfunctions. Then you can say, I'm going to act on the function, and this brings back the energy, which I call E, and it can rescale M to get rid of these factors 2 and ME. With this rescaled curly M, you can form these two combinations, and they are then unmixed. They each satisfy an SO3 algebra of just this type. So that's nice, and it also means we have the separate Casimir elements that are completely analogous to how L squared worked for SO3. But now we have this condition, M dot L is 0, and we can translate that to a condition on j and k, and in fact the condition becomes j squared minus k squared equals zero. That means that the representation we're looking at here is very special. It can be viewed as a great circle in four dimensions. So the ellipse in three dimensions is swept out as a great circle, not an ellipse, to the real circle. And this animation is made by this author, not by myself. So here's an exercise. So now they organize the algebra nicely. You don't have to do any differential operators. You just form this combination and solve for the energy. As a reminder, we started with m, we rescaled it, and we're going to add L squared to M squared. And you get an equation you can solve for the energy in terms of these J and K, remembering this condition. So for some of you at long last, the existence of this additional conserved quantity M gives some explanation why the energy in the hydrogen atom doesn't depend on the angular momentum quantum number L. But I promise this type of picture can be used much more generally. So let's zoom out a little bit. Define the Carton subalgebra as algebra elements that commute with all other elements. So they're diagonalizable. The number of such elements is called the rank. Here we're talking about two SO3 algebras formed by J and K. So you can draw a Dinkin diagram. You draw a dot for each of these commuting elements. So SO3 only has one, so they get one each, whereas SO4 has two. So the rank of the SO4 algebra, the four-dimensional rotation generators, is two, and the rank of each of these is one. And in the bigger picture, SO3 algebra is called A1, and SO4 is called D2. So there's a relationship between A1 times A1 and D2. Now what about these Casimirs? The general statement, Rocca's theorem, is that the number of independent Casimir operators is equal to the rank. So here the rank is 1 plus 1, 2. So indeed we have two a priori independent Casimirs for general representation. But we said here in the hydrogen atom we ended up with a very special representation where j squared minus k squared is 0. The generalization of the degree of the operator for this series dn, which are even dimensional SO algebras, is 2n minus 2. So here n is equal to 2, the rank is 2, so we get 2 times 2 minus 2 is 2. So the degree of both the Casimirs we had, both of these, is 2. They're both quadratic in the algebra elements. So the next level of difficulty, which is of course subjective, what is the next one, but to me A2 would be a next good example, SL3. So here we discussed rank 1, and the rank 2 thing was kind of very special because it could be decomposed like this, but SL3 is a real rank 2 situation, and here you have degree 2 and 3. So it's not just quadratic, but there's a cubic Casimir in SL3. Before that, though, I have another video where we stay in rank 1. And instead, we consider what happened to this algebra that I talked about briefly, the one we got in the beginning from forming L plus and L minus. It looks a little different than the SO3 algebra, and it's the SL2R algebra. It's actually isomorphic to SO2, 1, where we can think of this as having to do with time. 
So instead of rotations in three dimensions, this is like rotations in two dimensions and a time, quote-unquote, rotation, which is like a boost or Lorentz transformation in relativity. So this generalizes to three plus one dimensions like this. And I have a separate video on this, which I think maybe one should do before going to rank two and SL3.